March 1st, 1978, six members of the GBC met with His Holiness Sridhar Maharaj. In March of 1978, a small delegation of GBC men meets with Srila Sridhar Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada's godbrother, to seek his guidance on how to set up a multi-guru system in ISKCON. It was three and a half months since Srila Prabhupada's disappearance. I've explained how the GBC men had come to the wrong conclusion of what path Srila Prabhupada wanted ISKCON to take. The GBC were convinced that the 11 men Srila Prabhupada had appointed as Ritvik representatives of the Acharya were to cease acting in that capacity and instead were to automatically become 11 Diksha Gurus on the disappearance of His Divine Grace. Toward the end of February 1978, the GBC began their annual GBC meetings in Mayapur. This was their first annual meeting since Srila Prabhupada's disappearance. Their main concern was how to proceed with establishing this multi-guru system for ISKCON. How was it to work? How are these 11 men to become the next Acharyas? What exactly was their position to be? Are they to be accepted as Mahabhagavats, as topmost Vaishnavas? Are we to understand that all of them had advanced to the point where they can no longer fall down? Are, are they to assume Srila Prabhupada's position fully? Srila Prabhupada was the current Acharya, but now he's the previous Acharya. The chosen 11 are now the current Acharyas. Does this mean that they are going to replace Srila Prabhupada in his temples? Does this mean that the temple should take Srila Prabhupada's murtis and his paintings off the Vyasasans and, and, and that the, the local new guru can now sit on Prabhupada's Vyasasan? Some of the GBC and the new gurus actually thought that would be appropriate. Others considered this totally wrong. But who was right? If the new Acharyas don't take over Srila Prabhupada's Vyasasan, well, should the temples order new Vyasasans for the new gurus? Then how high should those Vyasasans be? Should they be shorter than Prabhupada's? I mean, how much shorter? I mean, is a quarter of a quarter of an inch, is that, is that sufficient? And, and what will be the standards of worship for the new gurus? When Srila Prabhupada was present, we didn't have daily Guru Puja for the previous Acharya, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati. We only had Guru Puja for the current Acharya, Srila Prabhupada. Well, shouldn't the temples follow that standard and just stop holding Guru Puja for Srila Prabhupada altogether? I mean, he's no longer the current Acharya. And instead, we should only hold Guru Puja for the current Acharya, right? Since the majority, however, the majority of the members uh, of the GBC and the, and the ISKCON temples at that time were Srila Prabhupada's disciples. Well, that idea just didn't go over very well. So should they hold two Guru Pujas, one for Srila Prabhupada and one for the new Guru? Then should the, these two Guru Pujas be at the same time? Or should one be af, you know, one after the other? And if one after the other, which Guru Puja should be first? Well, I mean, who's to say? Where, where, where were any guidelines to show the GBC, you know, just what was to be done? I mean, how to do it? How is it supposed to work? What prana mantras should the new initiates chant? Should all the new gurus give themselves pada titles like Vishnupad, Bhaktipad, Tirthapad, Acharyapad, or Big False Ego Pad? Or should their disciples select the Pada title for their Guru. How should Srila Prabhupada's disciples relate with the new Acharyas? How should the new Gurus relate with their far less junior God brothers? Guru is to be on the he is to be the topmost authority in the ashram where he acts as Guru. When Srila Prabhupada was present as the Guru for ISKCON, he had full authority over and above the GBC. Because the JBC members were his disciples. Prabhupada had full authority over all of the temple presidents, the JBCs. So where and how did the new gurus fit in to that managerial structure? Since they are the new gurus, does it, does it still matter what Srila Prabhupada had instructed? Or should everyone now just follow what the new gurus instruct? And how many photos of the gurus were the temples now to place on their altars?
Should all the temples have the photos of all 11 gurus, all at all times on the altars, or just the local guru or and a visiting guru? I mean, since there were now murtis of Srila Prabhupada being made <clears throat> placed on the Vyasasans and altars, should there now be murtis of the new acharyas made? Should they replace those of Prabhupada? I mean, who's to say? The problem was Srila Prabhupada hadn't said anything about any of this. He hadn't left them with any guidelines to follow on how to set up this multi-guru system and how it was to work alongside of a GBC. Even or even how the system was to look once it was fully set up. Since Srila Prabhupada hadn't said, then who was to say? Who can answer all these questions? The 24 members of the GBC at the time, which included the 11 new gurus, they met and they couldn't reach any sort of consensus amongst themselves as to these and other questions. They couldn't even come to an agreement on how to take the very first step in setting up this new multi-guru system. It soon became obvious they were totally in the dark on how to proceed. They were lost and they couldn't go to Srila Prabhupada anymore and ask him. There was no past precedence in our whole history of the Sampradaya of such of having a multi-center international organization which had a governing body committee and also multiple gurus who were to all function as gurus within the multi-ashram uh, 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 multi organization. So there was nothing to look back on to see any past precedence on how this was to be done. This was a totally unique situation. No past Acharya had ever set up such a system like this. It was totally unheard of. A single organization with multiple centers and a defined ultimate managing authority structure, but now they're supposed to be multiple initiating masters, gurus? Where do they fit in? How is it all to work? Why would Srila Prabhupada have appointed multiple successor gurus and yet not given even one single sentence of an instruction on how to set it up and how it was to work? We need to stop and really think about this. It's a point I've made many times in the, in the overall presentation, but it's a very important point. Was this really the path that he wanted his mission to take? And if it were the path that his divine grace wanted, why did he left? Why did he leave without giving even a thin thread of guidance? Rather, it appears that Srila Prabhupada left it for his not so well experienced GBC men to just figure out everything on their own. He left it for the GBC to figure out how gurus were to fit into the system of authority that Srila Prabhupada had established. And how were the GBC to figure all this out on their own? By trial and error? By more trials and more errors? after another error and another error, and on and on, until when? At what point will they know they finally got it right? Srila Prabhupada didn't even tell them what the system was supposed to look like when it was set up properly. So they won't even know when they have it all wrong or they have it all right. There was nothing at all for them to go on. And yet they were telling everyone that this was what Srila Prabhupada wanted. Even the JBC have agreed in their own defense that the reason why they committed so many mistakes in the early years trying to get everything set up was because the system had no precedence. Having a multi-guru system under a GBC for a large organization was just totally unprecedented. There has never been any system like this in the history of our Sampradaya. Quote, we did not know what to do because there was no precedent or scriptural rule that told us specifically what to do. End of quote. This is from Revised Guru Worship by Satsrup Goswami, written in 1985. As I am embedding the video into this presentation, syncing up the text, which is the last step in production of the video, I had a realization about this statement Satsvarup made, and so I just had to make an audio-only insert here to share. 
at the time, Satsarup was one of the leading GBC men. He was one of the 11 new Acharyas. And he is admitting here, with this very damning statement, he is admitting that the path the GBC had taken, trying to establish this multi-guru system, was totally outside of scripture. The path and system was outside of past precedents. It was outside of Shastra, it was totally outside of any guidance and instructions given by our own Acharya, Srila Prabhupada. Which means the path they were taking was totally apasadanta, it was totally bogus. Yes, totally outside of the realm of scripture. What a damning claim here made by one of the architects of this totally bogus path that they were trying to create. Now, as far as the Ritvik representative system, it is, there is some precedence of acharyas giving diksha when they were out, no longer present in their vapu form, such as uh, Byasdev when he gave diksha to um, uh, Madhavacharya. And the entire system is based on, uh, the Ritvik representative system is based on the instructions and guidance given by our founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada. Therefore, it is not totally outside of any authority at all. That is what the path they were trying to take, was outside of even Prabhupada's authority. An Acharya, a bona fide Shakti Vesha, especially a Shakti Vesha Acharya, one who's empowered directly by Sri Krishna, is a direct representative from Sri Krishna, he has the authority to uh, create a precedence, a new precedence, and that is what our Srila Prabhupada was doing. But not totally un, uh, outside of scripture, there is uh, and, and past precedence at all, as I said, there are examples of past acharyas giving diksha what outside of when they're no longer residing in this in this material world in their vapu form earthly uh, uh, physical form so the system of the ritvik representative system has it is based solidly on the guidance and instructions given by our founder acharya who was is was and is the authorized bona fide acharya, uh, current acharya. All right, back to our regularly scheduled presentation. He says there was no scriptural rules that could guide the GBC on what to do. The real point is there was no guidance given by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. That was the real problem. Why did these men not get it back in 1977 and 78? Why did they not get it in 1985? Why did they not get it even today? The reason Srila Prabhupada gave no guidance on this path is very simple, because this is not the path he wanted us to take. Actually, this is the very same argument that, G that the GBC have been giving against the Ritvig Ross path. They have argued that it has to be rejected because it it has no past precedence. That is a the path that the past acharya, that no past acharya had ever asked their followers to take before. Therefore, the GBC argued that the Ritvik representative of the acharya system has to be rejected for that one reason. Because Srila Prabhupada would never have wanted us to go down a path that no past acharya had ever set up before. And yet the multi-guru path they have taken fits that description even more than the Ritvik representative of the Acharya path. Yes, the Ritvik representative path was unprecedented, but the most important main difference was that His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, had given all needed details and instructions on what the Ritvik representative system was. He gave and documented that in writing with his signature that explains exactly how the system is to work. He clearly defined it, and that isn't all. He actually set up, most of the system was already functioning for many years before he departed. 
It was just the one last step. It was all that he, 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 uh, he, he gave to make it a fully operating Ridvik system. Unlike the multi-guru path, which has so many inherent, built-in, conflicting and overlapping you know, uh, authorities in the form of an already established GVC, and now there's to be multiple masters, gurus, and the Ridvik path has no such conflicts at all. The Ridvik path had, the Ridviks themselves have no position of authority. There was nothing to be left to be resolved. All that we needed to do was just to continue down the path that Srila Prabhupada had already been guiding us along for the whole time. And then the final steps he just he documented in writing, and it was all set up and ready for us to follow. Such a simple thing to do, yet we couldn't even get that right. Both paths, both paths have no past precedence. No past Acharya had ever set up either path. But Srila Prabhupada himself did set up the Ritvik representative path. And he gave full documentation on how that was to work. Plus the evidence supporting that he wanted multiple, multiple gurus in this skan is based on a single question and answer where the GBC asking the questions were confused and totally misunderstood. By an unbiased, intelligent, and logical analysis, we can clearly see which path makes sense and which one makes no sense at all. For such devotees, it is obvious which path the Srila Prabhupada really wanted us to take. By 1978, at the GBC meetings, the GBC and the new gurus found themselves totally in the dark and unable to come to any agreement amongst themselves on how to take even the first step, what to do. And who's to say? Because Srila Prabhupada did not say. After having three and a half months to think this over, to come up with ideas and a plan, and now all the GBC are meeting in person, and for over a week they're brainstorming this most pressing and important issue, and on, which, on, on how to start going down the path that they thought they were supposed to take. And yet after days of tossing ideas around, arguing over which guru should have what temple and zones and all sorts of other details to work out, there was no consensus and no agreement. Just days before Srila Prabhupada left this world, he knew that his men wouldn't know how to perform a samadhi, the samadhi rites for the, when the acharya uh, passes. Srila Prabhupada then suggested that the devotees can consult with Narayan Maharaj for this, since Narayan Maharaj lived nearby in Mathura, and Srila Prabhupada knew that he was knowledgeable on how to perform the final rites of an Acharya. And this is, in fact, what the JVC did when Srila Prabhupada departed. They approached Narayan Maharaj and asked for his guidance and help in performing the final Samadhi rites. Also notice that Srila Prabhupada knew that his devotees wouldn't know how to perform the final rites, or the Samadhi rites, Samadhi rites. He would have had to know, they wouldn't have known how to establish a multi-guru system either, within, you know, ISKCON in, a, in, a, in a, a situation that had never, there was no past precedence for it. He would have known they wouldn't have known how to do this. Why didn't he give any guidance? <clears throat> anyway, on the last day or so of February of 1978, and the GBC are all meeting and they can't come to any agreement on what to do, Tamal Krishna informs the GBC that actually in November, after Srila Prabhupada had suggested that uh, we can approach Narayan, uh, Narayan Maharaj for the uh, performance of the last rites, Tamal asked if there was anyone else the GBC could go to if they needed help. And Srila Prabhupada told him, that if the GBC has a philosophical question that they need guidance on, that the GBC can approach Srila Sridhar Maharaj in Mayapur for philosophical guidance. You see, actually, for the Prabhupada was there in Vrindavan, he was going to pass away in Vrindavan, and for the um, how to do the Samadhi rites would have to be done in Vrindavan. And, and uh, since Narayan Maharaj had... Prabhupada knew that he knew how to perform those rites, so he said, you can approach him. 
but for philosophical guidance. And then Prabhupada said, Srila Sridhar Maharaj in Mayapur, for philosophical guidance. As far as I know, there is no recording of this, of Srila Prabhupada asking this. And so aside from Tamal, however, Tripurari Maharaj says he was there, he was present, and he also heard that Srila Prabhupada say this, that the GBC can take philosophical guidance from Sridhar. And it makes sense because at times Srila Prabhupada, when he was in Mayapur, he would visit his old friend and godbrother Sridhar Maharaj, and they would sit and discuss philosophically. He had even once said that of all his godbrothers, the only one besides himself who was qualified to translate Srimad Bhagavatam was Sridhar Maharaj. We need to view this from two scenarios regarding this issue. One scenario would be that Srila Prabhupada wanted the Ritvik representative system to continue, and the other scenario is that Srila Prabhupada wanted the GBC to set up a multi-guru system after he departs. If we analyze this from the scenario that Srila Prabhupada wanted a Ritvik system to continue, then it makes sense that he would suggest to the GBC if they have some philosophical question that they can seek Sridhar's guidance on some general philosophical you know, advice. With this scenario, Srila Prabhupada had already documented in writing the system for how initiations were to go on and by, you know, the, with the July 9th letter. So they would, know, they would not need any guidance on how the initiations were to go on. But if the GBC had some other general philosophical question uh, and other than initiations, then yes, it would be all right to seek Sridhar's philosophical advice. But the most important thing, how initiations would go on, Srila Prabhupada had that was fixed and documented in writing with his signature. So Srila Sridhar Maharaj wouldn't go against those instructions. Now, following the scenario that Srila Prabhupada wanted some of the GBC men to become actual gurus, then it makes no practical sense that Srila Prabhupada would have advised the GBC to seek Sridhar's uh, philosophical advice. The reason that it would, uh, it, you know, it would make for a very awkward situation, resulting in major conflicts between Sridhar and the Iskand gurus. And in the end, this is actually what transpired. The awkward situation arises because the new bhaktas joining ISKCON are seeking, themselves they're seeking guidance from a spiritual master. But if they come to know that the ISKCON gurus are themselves seeking philosophical guidance from a senior Vaishnava who himself is a guru, then why settle for surrendering to the junior, um, you know, subordinate? Iskan Guru, better than new bhaktas seek the direct shelter and guidance from the senior Vaishnav who is also guiding and instructing the Iskan Gurus. This would undermine the entire Iskan mission as it would create an exodus of many and eventually all the new devotees over to Sridhar's camp. Iskan would fade away as Sridhar's mission would grow and replace it. Srila Prabhupada was aware of that potential of that happening due to his experience with his other god brothers. And under these circumstances, this would be the result even if Sridhar wasn't trying to take the men away. It would just occur naturally simply because of the nature of the awkward and conflicting circumstance. So knowing what Srila Prabhupada knew, it makes no sense that he would have suggested the GBC seek Sridhar's guidance on philosophical issues if he wanted some of those GBC men for themselves to become gurus. This point is driven home by factoring in what Srila Prabhupada wrote just three years earlier regarding Sridhar on the topic of establishing bogus, a bogus guru system after Srila Bhakti Siddhanta passed away. I will quote from what Prabhupada wrote, and he's speaking about Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. Quote, he, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, never recommended anyone to be Acharya of the Gaudiya Math. But Sridhar Maharaj is responsible for disobeying this order of Guru Maharaj, and he and the others who are already dead unnecessarily thought that there must be one Acharya. So Sridhar Maharaj and his two associate gentlemen unauthorizedly selected one Acharya, and later it proved a failure. The result is now everyone is claiming to be Acharya, even though there may 
they may be Kanista Arakari with no ability to preach. In some of the camps, the Acharya is being changed three times a year. Therefore, we may not commit the same mistake in our ISKCON camp. Actually, amongst my God brothers, no one is qualified to be Acharya. We shall be very careful about them and not mix with them. This is my instruction to you all. They cannot help us in our movement, but they are very competent to harm our natural progress. So we must be very careful about them. This is a letter to Rupanuga, dated April 28, 1974. Srila Prabhupada singles out Sridhar Maharaj by name regarding this very same topic of establishing acharyas after the disappearance of the previous acharya. Srila Prabhupada squarely puts the blame on Sridhar for disobeying Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's instructions on this very same topic. He blames Sridhar for taking the Gaudiya Math down the same and wrong path. However, even though Srila Prabhupada wrote somewhat harshly about Sridhar Maharaj, it is also a fact that Srila Prabhupada remained good friends with Sridhar. In the past, Sridhar Maharaj had stayed in Srila Prabhupada's home for many years as his guest when Srila Prabhupada was a grihasta. They served together in preaching and spreading Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's mission. And during the ISKCON years, Srila Prabhupada had a number of friendly meetings with Sridhar Maharaj where Srila Prabhupada enjoyed reminiscing with his old friend and holding philosophical discussions with him. Only if Srila Prabhupada wanted us to continue down the Ritvik representative path uh, and none of the GBC would have become actual regular gurus, would it make any sense at all that Srila Prabhupada would have suggested that on you know, philosophical issues, the GBC could take Sridhar's advice, but never on how to establish gurus after the departure of the previous acharya. That would make absolutely no sense at all that Srila Prabhupada would have ever suggested or wanted such a thing. However, this is, this is exactly what transpired. After Tamal, Krishna informed the GBC that Prabhupada had said they could take Sridhar's philosophical guidance. The GBC felt that this was the help they needed to establish their own multi-guru system. They were at a loss and they were in the dark and they didn't even know how to start down this path. Yes, seeking Sridhar's guidance seemed like not just the best option, but for them, they felt it was the only real option they had since Srila Prabhupada had just left them out in the cold and in the dark. The GBC sent a delegation of six to seven men seeking Sridhar Maharaja's guidance on the very same issue under the very same circumstances that Srila Prabhupada had said, Sridhar Maharaj is responsible for disobeying this order of Guru Maharaj. I mean, this is such an important topic, the most important topic. You know, Srila Prabhupada would not have left without giving the GBC, you know, full documented guidance. Why did Gaudiya was bad? Because they tried to become more Before, he came in all directions. And Never said that this man should be the next Tata. But these people just after fighting Ara, they began to fight brutally, assembly, assembly, assembly. Then he said, Never thought why Guru Maharaj gave us his instructions, so many things, why he did not say that this man should be They wanted to create artificially somebody else, and everything failed. They wanted to create artificial assembly and and everything. They did not consider in the common sense that he, Guru Maharaj, was there to uh, appoint somebody as Atharva. Why did he not say? He said, So many things. This point he missed. This point he missed. The real point. The real point. And then you see
So better remain a foolish person particularly to be directed by Guru Maharaj. That is perfect. And as soon as you learn the Guru Maharaj is there, now I am so advanced that I can kill my Guru and then do that. Now I am so advanced that I can kill, kill, kill my Guru and then do that. That was from August 16th, 1976. This point, Śrīla Prabhupāda missed. The real point, he gave guidance on so many things. He spoke of so many things before he left, but he never said that these 11 or more men should become Acharya. He never said how his mission was to function with multiple gurus. He never instructed how to set up such a system of multiple gurus functioning under the GBC. And yet, while Srila Prabhupada had not given any instructions or guidance how the multi-guru path was to work, he had given in writing all needed instruction on how the Ritvik Ras path was to work, and he, he had actually set it up and it had it functioning before he departed. He had given all instructions on how the GBC was to manage. For over seven years he had been given direction and, and, and uh, guidance on how they were to function. But the surreal point, about the gurus, multiple gurus, he missed it. He, didn't, he, he just didn't even think about it. The real point he missed. By the 1st of March, 1978, the GBC, unfortunately, were of the same mentality that Sridhar was when Srila Bhakti Siddhanta left this world. Sridhar Maharaj insisted that there had to be guru. And these GBC men were wrongly thinking that there must be new gurus that the 11 men that Srila Prabhupada had selected as Ritvik representatives, that they must now become the first new 11 Acharyas. But they needed guidance on how to make it work. And so on this day, March 1st, 1978, they sent a delegation to meet with the very same Sridhar Maharaj on the very same issue that Srila Prabhupada had said Sridhar Maharaj had disobeyed his own guru and put forth all wrong ideas some 35 to 40 years earlier. Two meetings were held and they discussed this issue for hours, asking dozens and dozens of questions, seeking Sridhar's enlightenment. The GBC write down nearly word for word what Sridhar Maharaj tells them. They transcribe his words that same day and wrote their own official paper, where at least 80% of this paper is based on Srila Sridhar's advice and guidance. Then the GBC present this paper. I still have my original copy, which I've already shown. But the GBC present this paper to all the members of ISKCON. The March 1978 GBC paper on initiations entitled The Process for Carrying Out Srila Prabhupada's Desires for Future Initiations. Anyway. That paper will be up on the... Should I do that? Yeah. Just put it up there and move it over. Okay? It's there. <laughs> so, this, um, this paper was the foundation for the multi-guru system in ISKCON. This paper started how... Um, this paper stated how initiations would continue in Srila Prabhupada's absence. This paper was... Yet it was based, 80% of it is based on the guidance given by, not Srila Prabhupada, by Sridhar Maharaj. Some of it word for word of what he instructed. Actually, we have the recordings. I'll put a link for that. There's a recording of those meetings with uh, Sridhar is meeting with the Gaudiya, I mean, with the GBC members who are meeting with Sridhar. It's actually recorded. It's from the, uh, it's from Sridhar's uh, uh, followers. Yet this official GBC document that informed, that formed the very foundation of the multi-guru system at ISKCON, it's not based on any guidance given by Srila Prabhupada at all, period. Because Srila Prabhupada 
had given absolutely no guidance, zero, for the multi-guru system. This is such a travesty. This is Srila Prabhupada's mission. It wasn't Sridhar's mission. It wasn't Sridhar's fault, though. It was the GBC's fault because they were the ones who wrongly thought that this was the path that Srila Prabhupada wanted. Of course, it all goes back to that same, that faulty, that wrong report of the May 28th meeting because they didn't have a recording at that time. They didn't have a, a, a copy of the recording. All they had was that GBC's official report and Prabhupada's going to name men who will be regular gurus. That's all they thought. And so that's why they rejected the July 9th letter as being the system he wanted for after he departs. So it all comes down to that. And then they, so, but they had no guidance on how to do that system. So they went to Sridhar. So the whole path that they are on, the foundation of it, isn't founded on Prabhupada's teachings. It's founded on Sridhar. And yet, you can see what Prabhupada said about Sridhar's guidance on such an issue. Srila Prabhupada said, Sridhar Maharaj is responsible for disobeying his own Guru Maharaj on this very issue. He was saying that he unnecessarily thought that there should be a Guru. And back in May of 1977, when the GBC met with his divine grace about this and brought up this all important topic, they could only think of only two questions to ask him. And they met with him only one time on this topic. And that conversation about this topic lasted only two minutes. And that was it. Then after that meeting, one of them wrote down, and what they wrote down the official GBC record of that meeting, and it was accepted by the whole GBC as being the official records of that meeting of what Srila Prabhupada answered those two questions. And that document is totally flawed, sorely lacking, gave totally misleading and totally wrong information. Yet with Sridhar Maharaj, they held two official meetings, speaking on this issue for hours and hours. And individually, various GBC members and the new gurus met with him privately to discuss further on this issue as well. We don't hear of any of these 11 Ridviks who were appointed by Prabhupada as Ridviks ever coming to Prabhupada and meeting with him in private to discuss with him what their how they were going to become guru and how this is to work and what their duties and how the how they would they didn't discuss this with Srila Prabhupada when he was present, even after the names had been given in that July 9th letter. But they meet and discuss with Sridhar for hours and hours as a GBC and then as individual members. After the four formal met, um, meetings with Sridhar, then they write down a comprehensive paper and they quote from Sridhar word for word. And around 80% of the paper is based on his, on his advice. They quoted from Srila Sridhar Maharaj. Well, I say they quoted from Srila Sridhar Maharaj. Actually, that isn't the correct terminology. It's 80% of the paper was based often word for word on what he had told them. But the, the GBC paper doesn't actually quote Sridhar Maharaj and, and, or mention his name. So they don't actually give him credit for the ideas that the GBC adopted. But when they met with Srila Prabhupada, they didn't come out with a paper and give it to all the devotees to tell us what Srila Prabhupada's uh, system was going to be. In 19, uh, 1977, when they met with Srila Prabhupada, they came up with their GBC report, but that was only for the GBC members. When they wrote a summary of those meetings to the temple presidents, they left out all mention of, of asking Srila Prabhupada anything about this topic and all mention of what his responses were. They didn't share that with the rest of the devotees. When the July 9th letter came, they decided that letter was just really bad. And they didn't want, they only shared it amongst the GBC members. 
they disobeyed Srila Prabhupada's order and didn't send it out to the rest of the devotees. So what instructions Prabhupada gave, they kept it away from us. But when they met with Sridhar Maharaj, <laughs> then they write a paper and make sure everybody reads it. Because they had told Sridhar that this is the system Prabhupada wanted, and so Sridhar gave advice on how to set up that system. So that paper is going to support that they are, this is who they are, and this is what they're going to do, and this is the system. They wanted us to read that. Prabhupada's instructions? No. We have to keep this away from the devotees. This is, it, this is why so many of us are so disturbed about all of this. It's been disturbing for so many decades the way the GBC treated us about this topic, the way they treated Prabhupada about this topic, basically. They didn't go to Prabhupada and spend hours and hours discussing with him. They'd go to Sridhar. And I'm not blaming Sridhar, you know. Most of Srila Prabhupada's disciples, the majority of us, we had no knowledge at all for many years that the GBC had even gone to Sridhar and sought his guidance at that time on this issue. And, or did we know that the GBC and, and many of the gurus were continuing to seek his guidance for many years? They tried to keep this private. They tried to keep it, uh, 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 they didn't want it to be known openly or publicly. As I said, many rank and file ISKCON devotees didn't learn that the GBC were meeting with Sridhar for many years. When Jayatirtha fell down, and the Jayatirtha was having fall down after fall down, and the GBC just didn't know how to handle him. He wasn't listening to them. He wasn't following their advice. So they advised him to go and see if Sridhar could help him. And Sridhar did. Sridhar actually helped Jayatirtha. And Jayatirtha felt uh, thankful for that. And so he went public. And he told his disciples openly that he was going to Sridhar, that Sridhar had helped him. I'll explain more about this at the later timeline, at the appropriate timeline. But the the first formal meeting with Sridhar by the GBC delegation, it is recorded, as I said, and I will play just uh, excerpts, selected excerpts of it. But there is a link on the screen if you want to hear the entire recording. After the departure of our beloved spiritual master, we came to offer our respects to you, as well as to hear your esteemed Upadesh on certain matters, if you'd be kind enough. Mentioned in this house is an example. The Gurudev, Shishra is like a lotus, and the Gurudev, the water around, just in a pond. Ma- yes. <coughs> when uh, our Srila Prabhupada uh, left, then he has given instruction yes. that for initiating yeah. And for carrying on the Sampradaya, yeah. there would be eleven. In the beginning, he appointed eleven yeah. uh, devotees, his disciples, to be initiating spiritual masters yeah. or to accept disciples. And uh, in the future, that number would also be able to be increased. Yeah. So the, we wanted to take your advice on some points as to uh, various details of how these initiating spiritual masters should deal with certain questions. Mm. If we could ask a question to you then. Knowing the long-lasting friendship that our Srila Prabhupada shared with his godbrother Sridhar, Srila Sridhar Maharaj, I firmly believe that Sridhar had only the best of intentions. I would also think that Sridhar was he was pleased that after Srila Prabhupada had departed, that the Is- ISKCON's GBC men were coming to him and asking him for guidance, especially on such an important issue. But there are major problems right at the beginning. Jai Pataka and the ISKCON uh, GBC delegates have come to seek Srila Sridhar's guidance. 
But for Sridhar to give them the best advice, he needs to have been given the correct information. The crucial information they gave him was false and misleading. There's the same information based on that false and misleading GBC report. The Prabhupada had named these men to become actual gurus. Here Jai Pataka states that Srila Prabhupada he, that, that uh, Srila Prabhupada had instructed that for initiating and carrying on the Sampradaya, he had appointed 11 disciples who were to become initiating spiritual masters. Srila Prabhupada never appointed anyone to become regular initiating guru after he departed. He only said on his order that one can become a regular guru, but he never gave any such order. He had appointed those 11 men to act as his Ritvik representatives only. He never gave any of them an order to become actual guru. Srila Prabhupada had stated three times that it would be on his order, but by his order, when he orders, but they wrongly claimed that it was on his disappearance. While these GBC men weren't purposefully saying something that wasn't true, I mean, what they were saying wasn't true, but they, they were just simply saying what was in that false and misleading GBC report and they didn't know it was false and misleading. So what they thought they were saying was the truth, but it was actually not the truth. So what they're telling Sridhar and what he based his decisions on was a false pretext, a false understanding. The GBC had propagated this idea that, that Prabhupada had authorized them to select new gurus. And that is simply a totally false and bogus idea. There are only two times that His Divine Grace gave instruction regarding selecting uh, the GBC selecting gurus. One was when He quoted His own spiritual master, instructing that the GBC is not to select a, uh, gurus. Uh, quoting, His idea was Acharya was not to be nominated amongst the governing body. It's from a letter, April 22nd, 1974. The other was when Tamal asked Srila Prabhupada about rubber stamping gurus. And Prabhupada's and rubber stamping mean you just call someone a guru, like the GBC, say, I ordain you as a guru. I have put the rubber stamp, you are now an ISKCON guru. So Tamal, uh, uh, Krishna asked Srila Prabhupada about that. And Srila Prabhupada said, you can cheat, but it won't be effective. Not rubber stamp. It will not be effective. You can cheat, but it will not be effective. Not rubber stamp, not rubber stamp. It will not be effective, not be effective. You can cheat, but it will not be effective. You can cheat, 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 but it will not be effective. It will not be effective. You can cheat, but it will not be effective. A guru can become guru when he is ordered by his guru, that's all. Otherwise, nobody can become guru. A guru can become guru when he is ordered by his guru, that's all. Otherwise, nobody can become guru. Nobody, nobody can become guru. A self-made guru cannot be guru. He must be authorized by the bona fide guru, then he is guru. This is the Oh. Yeah. Nobody can be self-made anything, a medical practitioner. He cannot become self-made. That I have studied all the medical books in my home. No. Have you ever gone to the medical college and taken instruction from the bona fide the teachers that if you have got this certificate, then you are medical practitioner. Similarly, bona fide guru means he must be authorized by the superior guru. Just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Amara Gaya Guru Haya Taro He must receive the order from the superior. And the superior must be bona fide. Then he is bona fide. Not self-made. A guru can become guru when he is ordered by his guru. That's all. Otherwise, nobody can become guru.
A guru can become guru when he is ordered by his guru. That's all. Otherwise, nobody can become guru. Nobody, nobody can become guru. Not rubber stamp. Then in that way, effect. You can cheat, but it will not be effect. Only the current Acharya can appoint successor gurus. Śrīla Bhakti Siddhānta instructed not by vote of the GBC. Śrīla Prabhupāda never gave any such authorization or instruction to the GBC. For the GBC to push this idea that Śrīla Prabhupāda had authorized them to select new gurus, it is not based on any explicit instruction given to them by Śrīla Prabhupāda, but rather it is based on their own concocted conjecture. And taking that concocted conjecture as having any sort of precedence over the actual instructions that he did give, it's just outright deplorable. It's totally unacceptable. Srila yes. Sridhar Maharaj based the advice he gave on the faulty information they gave him. And since the information they gave him was false and faulty, then his advice, I mean, it was the best advice under such a situation. He could only give the best that he could under that uh, situation. But it wasn't the best advice because the information he based it on was faulty. But the GBC told Sridhar and the members of ISKCON that Srila Prabhupada had authorized them to select additional gurus. And they have been doing this now for over 40 years. Jaipataka continued. So we want to take your advice on some points as to various details, how these initiating spiritual masters should deal with certain questions. If we could ask questions to you then. So we wanted to take your advice on various details regarding the new gurus. Looking back, we have the advantage of hindsight vision. And with that hindsight vision, it appears odd that at least Sridhar Maharaj should have suspected that something was totally amiss here. And the GBC men should have as well. Why? Because if Srila Prabhupada had appointed or even just wanted multiple men, multiple men to act as gurus within ISKCON, then why didn't Srila Prabhupada give all necessary guidance and details for how to set up the system and how it was to work? Why didn't Srila Sridhar Maharaj question why the GBC had such questions on such an issue as this? I mean, surely he would have realized Srila Prabhupada would have given them sufficient guidance on what to do. But Srila Sridhar Maharaj says, yes, you may ask. Okay, I'm putting this in as a re-edit. In my original video and script, I took time and went over many of the questions that the GBC asked Sridhar and his answers and advice. But really, those details are not of any real importance. I will go over a, a few of them shortly, but the main important, important point about all of this <clears throat> is why the GBC were even approaching Sridhar Maharaj regarding how to establish multiple gurus in, ISKCON's, in the ISKCON mission in the first place. Why were they approaching him? Because Srila Prabhupada himself had not given a single shred of guidance at all period for such a multi-guru system and such a path. The main points we've already made regarding the May 28th meeting and the July 9th letter. The evidence clearly shows that, well, number one, Srila Prabhupada had only named those 11 men to act as his Ritvik representatives, period. That's all he was selecting. We have the recording, the July 7th recording. That was all the criteria was, where they were located. So he would have 11 Ritvik representatives around the world uh, in various locations. That was the criteria. Not that they were the most advanced disciples, not that they were uh, completed their training and could take dis and were qualified to take disciples all over the world. That was not the criteria. The only criteria was they happened to be GBC men and where they were located. You know, that's all. So number two, um, and so Prabhupada only selected, I'm sorry, number one, part of number one, Prabhupada only selected them to act as his Ritvik representatives. 
That's all he had selected them for and authorized them for, period. <clears throat> number two, he had never ordered any of them to become actual gurus. And number three, the GBC misunderstood everything, got everything all wrong due to the faulty May 28th GBC report. That we've already covered all of these things. And the evidence shows, you know, that's, that is the evidence. We have it. It's on recording. We have recordings. We have. So Prabhupada did not authorize those men to act as gurus. So anyway, now after his disappearance, and they're trying to put this all together, they're thinking they're going to be gurus. They're supposed to be gurus. Well, how are they going to be gurus? How are there going to be multiple masters in the one organization? How is that going to work? And there's a GBC. Is that GBC above them? And these are some of the questions that they had to ask Sridhar. The GBC were not selected by Prabhupada to be guru. But these men were, well, allegedly. So that means... Because everybody understood the philosophy back in 1977, 78. Everyone understood that to be a guru, one must be on the Mahabhagavad platform. Everyone understood that. Sridhar Maharaj understood that. So the point was that Prabhupada had allegedly selected just those 11 men out of 24 GBC. He had only selected just those 11. So the assumption was that these 11 were Mahabhagavats. Prabhupada had recognized them as Mahabhagavats. And therefore, how could Mahabhagavats be under a GBC who weren't Mahabhagavats? So these are the conundrums. How is that supposed to work? So that's why some of those questions that they asked Sridhar were about that. But of course, the whole premise was wrong. Prabhupada had not selected those men as gurus. That was wrong. It was all based on that faulty GBC report. So anyway, these are our main points. Uh, you know, this multi-guru path was not the path that Srila Prabhupada wanted, period. Simple. That's it. What he had set up was a system by which he, Srila Prabhupada, would remain the one and only initiating guru for his ISKCON mission. I've explained. Why did he do that? Why would he do that? When Srila Bhakti Siddhanta was leaving this world and he saw no one was qualified, he just selected no one. He just he said the, the, the next guru will rise up like a full moon in the sky. It'll be obvious. But Prabhupada didn't say that. So what was his? Because he had started this mission, mission all over the world. He had taken Lord Chaitanya's holy, the holy name and Lord Chaitanya's mission to basically every <laughs> town and village in the world. At least he got the whole process going. He took it to every continent, to every country practically. All over the world. Africa, Australia, India, I mean India, <laughs> Russia, China, all over Europe, America, South America, North America, all over. He had, Vedic culture used to be worldwide, and it had, in the age of Kali, shrunk, shrunk, shrunk to just India. But advice but actually means the whole planet, but it shrunk to just what we call India. World War II, they even gave up part of India, Pakistan, East Pakistan, you know, but it was shrinking. Then, Prabhupada took the Vedic culture and has spread it all over the world. Bhagavad philosophy, put out millions and millions of books, of his books, planting the seeds everywhere. Every, the people who were becoming required the diksha of a pure devotee, of a true Mahabhagavad. He understood that. He also understood his disciples were not Mahabhagavats yet. He could not compromise the integrity of the specific succession. He could not authorize men who were not qualified. 
He had even said just a month or so before, I mean, just in, in April of 1977, what is the use of producing rascal gurus? If they're not qualified, what's the use of producing a rascal guru? He referred to those who are not qualified, who take the position of guru as being rascals. So he would not compromise on that. He could not uh, you know, recommend anyone to become guru if they're not fully qualified. And he agreed in April of 1977 with Tamal's assessment that none of them were qualified yet. Prabhupada agreed with that. He said he's still waiting to give his order. Be- can't give his order if they're not qualified. So the, we have all this. It's all recorded. We have it all. We've already given all these arguments. So Prabhupada, it was an unusual circumstance. Vedic culture was now being, being spread again back into the whole world. Bhagavad philosophy, everything. Rathayatra is in all the major cities. Prabhupada did so much. Temples, all of the Radha Krishna deity, worship on such a high standard. I've uh, <clears throat> gone to some of these Hindu temples and they put in a, a Radha Krishna deity. They're not anywhere. They're not better to have a photograph, you know, because they're not worshiping them properly. They don't have artiques. Prabhupada set up a whole standard, a very high standard of deity worship all over the world. So it was an unusual circumstance. The conditioned souls that would be coming would need a pure devotee. So Prabhupada took an unusual, you know, approach. He set up a Ritvik system. Authorized a Ritvik system by which his disciples, his followers, who are authorized as Ritviks, which he authorized 11, he said it can be added to, they will then carry out the physical aspects of the initiation process on his behalf, he will remain the actual one and only Diksha Guru for his mission. All of this, we just got on the wrong path because of that one GBC report. The whole thing went down the wrong path and the GBC had been too damn stubborn, too damn stubborn, too too to just take the time and realize it was all wrong and to take the humble position and correct it. Anyway, so in my original videos, <laughs> you know, on this topic, on this about Sridhar, going to Sridhar, you know, I gotten into a lot of the questions, but uh, at least I want to go, let's cover one question. That, and I, <clears throat> Jaipataka asked, and I quote, Can there be any restriction on the activities of the guru? And Harikesh adds, Because we are working within a government, with we have GBC, a governing body. It's governing body of the whole society. Another GBC adds, So, is it uh, so? It, it, it is possible that even some members of the governing body they are not gurus, but can the governing body as a whole make a restriction on the activities of the individual guru? This would have been a good question, <laughs> had Shri Prabhupada actually uh, selected those men as gurus. Obviously, he had not, but <clears throat> the. Uh, they were wanting because they were wanting to do different things. Or the different gurus, now that the gurus, anyway, these different Ridviks who thought they were gurus, they were wanting to do different things. And some of the non guru GBC were saying, You can't do that. You can't do that. Not in Prabhupada's mission. You can't do that. So, uh, who, well, who are you? You're not a Mahabhagavad. You weren't selected by Prabhupada like I was. They weren't selected by Prabhupada. They were selected by him only as Ritviks. That's it. <laughs> anyway, but they were thinking, oh, they've been selected as Guru because that GBC report said Prabhupada will name, the men he will name will be Guru. That's not what Prabhupada said. You know. <clears throat> 
sorry, with my voice, but that's not what Prabhupada said. So Shaitan Maharaj, what was his response to that? Can non-guru GBC be, have authority over an actual guru? Shaitan Maharaj laughingly said, a most difficult thing. A non-guru comes to regulate the gurus. A most difficult thing. Yes, his point has been, uh, I mean, this point has been and will always remain, as Sridhar Maharaj called it, a most difficult thing. You know, how to blend in and, and force fit and, you know, so-called gurus and to the ultimate authority of the GBC uh, within the same, you know, organization. With Anyway, just the idea made Sridhar laugh. Why? Because the idea is laughable. How can you have non-gurus regulating the real masters? It's ridiculous. But this has been the system in ISKCON for 40 years. It's a laughable situation because it's really a joke. Because none of this was supposed to happen. There weren't supposed to be multiple gurus, only Prabhupada. That was it. He set up the Ritvik system so he could remain the one and only Diksha Guru, a real Mahabhagavata to give real diksha. <clears throat> so, you know, I mean, who's the highest authority in ISKCON? Is it the GBC or is it these new masters, spiritual masters? Obviously, Prabhupada named the GBC as the ultimate authority. He never mentioned anything at all, period, ever, about there being multiple gurus in the future of ISKCON. Not once. You won't find anything. He never mentioned it. The whole idea came from that corrupt GBC report that Prabhupada will soon name men who will be, they'll be gurus. Prabhupada didn't say that. He said he'll soon name men who will be Ritviks. Anyway, obviously, in the past tradition, the guru is the one and only master in the ashram where he acts as a guru. Srila Prabhupada was the one and only master of his ISKCON mission. He sat firmly above the GBC. But what about all these new, multiple numbers of gurus, numbers of masters? Where do they fit? Sridhar admitted this is a most difficult thing. Anyway, this has been the major problem since day one of this multi-guru system. You know, even before the GBC actually formally started down this path, they could see this was a major issue. And thus they sought Sridhar's enlightenment. How is this supposed to work? His first response was he laughed at the thought of it. He went on to say that those who are not fit for guru, they are not to be, uh, you know, then, uh, you know, how, how can they come and guide the guru? And uh, so he was saying that basically he was advising that the gurus form their own higher GBC. <laughs> and that the gurus now guide, give guidance to the non-guru GBC. But, you know, he had already told them to keep their, 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 the, 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 the gurus keep their GBC zones separate. And so now he's, and, and then he started, so now his advice was to resolve this. He said, then every GBC be, should become a guru. What? Sridhar had no authority to appoint Prabhupada's disciples to become gurus. And the GBC had no authority to self-declare themselves as guru either. So, you know, while the GBC did choose to implement part of his idea, they didn't, you know, obviously fully implement his idea. And yet that advice that he gave, that became the basis of what would become known as the zonal acharya system in ISKCON, where the new acharyas became the absolute authority for their own zone. Again, none of these things were based on any guidance at all given by his divine grace, Iskand's founder Acharya, his divine grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, because Srila Prabhupada gave absolutely no guidance at all regarding multiple gurus in his mission. He never spoke once, not one time, of there being multiple gurus in the future of Iskand. All of this was based 
you know, the whole system the GBC have gone down since March of 1978, the foundation was based on the guidance given by Srila Sridhar Maharaj, not Srila Prabhupada. Anyway, first, Sridhar Maharaj referred to the GBC, who weren't appointed by Srila Prabhupada, uh, as being not fit to be guru. Now, the logic was that since Srila Prabhupada had only selected 11 out of the 24, GBC men at the time to become guru, then it follows that he saw, that Prabhupada saw that the other GBC men weren't fit yet to become guru. But of course, that's all based on that false GBC report. Because Prabhupada never selected those 11 men to be guru ever, only as Ritviks. And 22 years later, the GBC finally realized that. Srila Prabhupada had never appointed those 11 men to be guru. It was a mistake. They misunderstood. They admitted it 22 years later, that they were confused about this. And they were confused because of that GBC report. But instead of going back to all the evidence, as we have shown here, presented, and understanding that the whole thing was a mistake, everything, they still stayed on the multi-guru path. You know, and they said, well, Prabhupada didn't directly order anyone. He indirectly ordered. <laughs> All baseless. Totally baseless. I mean, look, the whole path they're on has no basis in Prabhupada's teachings, in Prabhupada's instructions. Another point that Sridhar made later on was that the guru, he must have his own ashram. He gave the example, the brahmachari, when he gets married, he doesn't stay in the guru's ashram. He doesn't bring wife and children and have children in the guru's ashram. He leaves and he starts his own ashram. His grihasta ashram. Then he has his children and he becomes the master in that ashram. He becomes the prabhu. The master of his wife, the master of his children. That's what a brahmacharya does. So he said, Guru, they need their own ashram to be the guru of that ashram. My point, I didn't know Sridhar made that point, but he made that point. But the thing was, he didn't press for it because he assumed that Srila Prabhupada had asked these men to be gurus within ISKCON. So he didn't push that point, but he brought it up. Philosophically, it was practically impossible and practical to have multiple gurus in the same ashram, the same mission, and that a guru needs his own separate ashram, just like a grihasta, just like the brahmachari who becomes a grihasta. He has to move out of his guru's ashram, start his own ashram. Then he becomes the prabhu in that ashram. He's still the disciple of his, of his guru, but he's, he's not, because he's now married and he becomes the prabhu of his family, he's not doing that within the guru's ashram. He has his own. So in order to become the Prabhu, in order to become the master, a spiritual master needs his own separate ashram. 